Hello everyone and welcome to a new bookshelf tour with yours truly, Allie Alvis. You may know me better as Book Historia, your friendly neighborhood pink-haired book historian. You might have noticed that this video quality is now beautiful and excellent. And that is thanks to the generosity of an anonymous donor, uh, my Patreon patrons, and the sale of these beautiful weighted book snakes, uh, which you can find on my Etsy. Uh, I will be using these throughout the video to hold some pages down. Um, but it is thanks to all of those sources of income that I was able to buy a brand new camera. So thank you so much for all of you, all of your help and to all of you who tune in uh, when I'm able to post videos and you can look forward to much more high quality stuff in the future. So today I'm going to be doing a few very special books and one based on a request. Uh, I know based on my bite-sized book history videos, you know how much I love miniature books. Uh, so I will be talking about one of those today. I will also be talking about these two books, which are Victorian. Uh, are they Victorian? No, they're a little later than Victorian. They're uh, very early 20th century. Uh, and these are actually heirlooms. Um, my great grandpa uh, owned these books. Um, so I will tell you all about them in a bit. But first, we will talk about this big old chunk of limp vellum. Um, this book is uh, an acquisition from, I don't know, probably six years ago. Uh, I bought it in Scotland when I lived over there. Um, so I will be right back and get it set up. All right, so what are we looking at? This is a very big book. Um, and it looks a bit different from how you might expect uh, a book to look. Uh, this is not leather, this is vellum. Uh, actually, more appropriately, parchment, uh, which is a different sort of preparation of animal skin. Um, instead of being tanned like leather, it, it doesn't turn out brown. It sort of turns out this, uh, this light tan color. Um, and parchment slash vellum is the same thing that, for example, medieval manuscripts are written on. Uh, so it can be used as pages or as covering material. Vellum in general uh, means the, the finer stuff, the smoother, thinner, more page-like material. Well, parchment is a bit lower quality, um, but in general, bindings like this are called vellum bindings. I don't know. Um, and you can see it's, <laughs> this is a, one of my more well-loved books. Uh, it's got all of this splitting going on up here. Uh, it's missing its little ties. Um, it sat in the sun for a long time. Its, its title is pretty faded uh, and it's pretty warped. Um, but you know me, I love a yucky book. Uh, this is not quite as yucky, honestly, as I would like. Um, but the reason I bought it, so this is a bit of a story time. Uh, when I studied abroad in Paris in, I think my junior year of high school, I went down by the Seine. Uh, and I wandered along and I saw the Bouquinistes, which are these incredible bookseller stalls that sort of line the Seine in Paris. Um, they've been there for centuries. Uh, there are guilds. I think they still have a guild of booksellers uh, at the Seine. So I was around 16 years old and I was walking by all of these incredible stalls full of old books and my eye was caught by some light colored book, something that I had never seen before. And it was a book that was bound in vellum. I obviously didn't know that at the time. I don't even remember the title of the book. I just remember being so struck by it. And so of course I, I went up to the seller and I asked him in my high school French, you know, how much is this? And I, I believe it was something like 85 euros or possibly more, and at the time that was a huge amount. Uh, studying abroad in Paris is not cheap, uh, so I didn't have the, the spare cash laying around to shell out on a book. Um, I did try to make him an offer for, I think it was 50 or 60 euros, and he brushed me off. I don't know if it was my bad French or <laughs> if it was just, you know, that was too low for him. Uh, but since then, I've always loved vellum bindings and I've always wanted one. And until I bought this book, I had not had one. Um, I bought this at an auction at the Lion and Turnbull auction house in Edinburgh. 
and it has some really interesting aspects to it, but I really bought it just because of the vellum binding. Uh, it reminds me of my early days in books when I, I didn't even know what I was looking at, um, but it just, it's really evocative for me. Um, so another thing you might notice about the video today is I have this, oh, it's not really on camera, but I have my secondary camera here so I can get some better close-up shots uh, so I don't have to hold the book up and wave it around um, because as I mentioned, this is not in the best condition. Um, so as I said, I think uh, this is a limp vellum binding. Uh, actually, it's more like semi-limp. Uh, it does have a sort of card element to it uh, to reinforce the covers. Um, so it's not just totally floppy, but it's, it's not rigid like you might expect a book cover to be. Um, let me grab another support. Just tilt it up like this. <laughs> I'm, I'm remembering all of these new things to show you. Uh, so remember those nasty, crumbly book wedges that I used to have? Uh, I whipped up some cute little uh, marbled material covers for them, so they're not quite so terrible to look at. Um, but yeah, so these are those old foam wedges, but just with uh, new clothing. So let's put some weight on this. We have here, when we first open the book, this nice book plate, which says Hopeton. And that is our first clue to the provenance of this. Uh, as we move inwards a little bit, we come to the title page, which has a few ownership marks on it. Hooray, we love those. Um, so we have here, Our Lord Seton and a date and the title. So Lord Seaton actually established Hopeton House, which is a stately home sort of on the outskirts of Edinburgh. Uh, it was later purchased by the Hope family, uh, and they were the ones that named it Hopeton House. Um, but it's really cool that this book started with Lord Seaton uh, back in 1588, and eventually was owned by the Hopes. This is their family uh, crest here. You can kind of see the ghost of um, old shelf marking, uh, I think F2 something something, uh, and also Scotland, page 486. Uh, this book is about military exploits and military leaders. So this is probably about um, some sort of Scottish battle or Robert the Bruce or something like that. Um, I haven't actually looked. Uh, but this book was published in, here we go with the Roman numerals again, 1538. So, uh, no, 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 15, I'm so bad at Roman numerals. No, it's 1588. Uh, so Lord Seton actually put 1588 uh, in Latin numerals, Arabic numerals, uh, to show when this book was published. Uh, to make it easier for dinguses like me who take a while to read Roman numerals, but still screw it up. But, you know, live book history, not everybody can do everything perfect the first time through. Um, I'm not sure what, like, these other little symbols are here. So, like, this sort of four with the above the three numerals, and this little triangle looks like the Deathly Hollows or something. But I always love when people personalize their books like this. Um, there is another bit of interesting provenance here, which is a, uh, a snipping from an auction catalog from Sotheby's, actually. And you can see here there's also a little pencil annotation saying that it's a cutting from the Sotheby's catalog. Uh, I bought this in 1903 and I paid eight pounds for it. Uh, I know eight pounds would have been a lot more in 1903 before decimalization. Um, I don't think it's as much as I paid for it. I, I don't really know. Decimalization experts, feel free to weigh in. Uh, I didn't pay as much for it as you might think, uh, because when I was in Edinburgh, I was a graduate student, so again, not flush with cash. Uh, but I, I did shell out probably more than I should have for a few books like this one. Um, so, 
as you can see, and as I have mentioned ad nauseum, this is a big book. Uh, this is what is the called the folio format. Uh, so there are different formats of books, uh, referring to the number of times that a piece of paper is folded to make up the pages. So in the case of a folio, these sort of pieces of paper, which are roughly this size when they uh, come out of the vat, um, these are all handmade papers. Um, so this would just be folded once, and that gives you a nice big book. Uh, if they're folded again, you get a quarto, which means you have four pages. With a folio, you have two leaves. Uh, with a quarto, you get four leaves. With an octavo, which another fold, you have eight leaves. Uh, and so the more you fold a paper, obviously the smaller and smaller it gets. So with something like a 32 mo, you have a bunch of leaves, but the book is very small. So um, this is a nice big folio. Um, and the wonderful thing about folios is that it's really easy to see the watermark. So as I said, this is handmade paper. Um, paper in this period was made by basically like a big screen door dipped into a vat of slurry, uh, just mushed up uh, material, um, usually recycled linen rags. Um, so this slurry is just sort of mixed in with water and you would dip the screen in and sort of shake it out, make everything even, um, and then peel off that sheet and let it dry. And then you have a piece of handmade paper. Um, but those big screens had wire designs in them sometimes. Um, and these are called watermarks. Uh, they make an imprint on the paper when it's being made. So when you hold it up to the light, you can actually see the little symbol. Um, so unfortunately, this book is very text heavy, which means it can be difficult to find the watermarks, but I did find one, so hang on. Okay, so what I am going to do is shine a flashlight actually through the page here, uh, and it will illuminate the watermark. Um, I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it very well, um, given the, the contrast of the camera. Um, but it's sort of two B's back to back uh, with, I think, a little torch coming out of the top. Um, I am honestly surprised that paper this size does not have a bigger watermark. Um, they had a lot of real estate to play with and they just didn't really use it to the, the best of their abilities. Um, but I'm glad I found one at least. So other than that, this book doesn't have too many unique characteristics. Uh, as I said, it's about military campaigns. That's not really my jam. Um, I'm not really a military historian, uh, nor am I fluent in Latin. So, um, yeah. Battles, Thucydides. Oh, let's see what Scotland on that page is. Scotland page 486. Let's find out. And this is why we have those book supports. So that way, as we move through, we are not cracking the spine. Oh, towards the end here. Let's move this. 482, 3, 4, and 6. Um, is that really the right page? Yeah, 486. Uh, it must be a, a small part of a, a larger section or something. Uh, Aragone, Aragonois? Good Lord, this is in French. Uh, I'm not fluent in French either, uh, nor am I fluent in uh, military history. So no matter what, this is not easy reading for me. Um, but Montpellier... Chateau de Naples. Uh, so I don't really know what they're talking about, Paige. Uh, ah, I hadn't turned the page. That'll do it. Uh, Paul Juve? Don't know. Well, uh, I trust whoever made that annotation more than I trust my French and uh, military literacy. So uh, we'll just have to leave it to faith. Um, but as we get nearer to the end here, we have the final pages. 
Um, only half a sheet here, not sure what's going on there. Um, and then evidence of these edge ties that used to be attached and are long gone. Um, these are sort of extended edges to protect the text block. Um, so originally they would have been more flush against the text block, but uh, with centuries of different storage solutions and different environments, uh, it's gotten a bit cockled and uh, uneven. Um, but we can still appreciate it for what it is, uh, which is really cool and a fulfillment of the first old book that I ever wanted. Okay, so moving on to these two, which are 20th century, which is wild for me to be talking about. Uh, I am very much a hand press book historian. Uh, but these two, as I said in my introduction, are heirlooms. They belonged to my great-grandfather, James, James F. Alvis. Um, he was a builder of all things, um, being an engineer and somebody who builds things kind of runs in the family. Um, so these are both sort of design, carpentry, houseworking books. Um, they're both cool in different ways. Um, but starting at the binding, these are what's called publisher's cloth bindings. Uh, in this period, when we are well out of the hand press period, uh, everything to do with books is really made by machines at this point. Um, up until the 1830s-ish, everything was done by hand. Uh, and around 1830, 40, 50, uh, the Industrial Revolution really kicked in in Europe and America. And we start seeing things like this, which are beautiful. They're so bright and well-designed. Um, they, they do things visually that leather can't really do. Um, but this is actually cheaper than leather, which is why booksellers move to having books like this. Um, always good to save money. Um, but the cloth, it's a very strong material, but it's, it's not handmade. Uh, so there is some standardization across books. Uh, if you pick up another copy of this universal design book from 1905, it will probably look exactly like this one, um, with the exception of being owned by my great-grandfather. Um, so this book also has these fun end leaves, um, which are a take on the hand press end leaves of uh, nice patterned stuff, but again, this is not, it's not like hand done, it's not hand marbled or uh, paste paper, this is a printed pattern. So let's start with this one because it doesn't take very long until I am out of my depth with it. Uh, this is hardcore carpentry. Um, I said that building stuff runs in the family. Uh, I tend to eyeball stuff more than I do measure things. Uh, so this is math and wood cutting formulas and all sorts of very complex uh, sort of information. Um, and both of these books came out long before you could just Google how to make a join on YouTube um, or how to glue two pieces of wood together and make a drawer. Um, so books like this were extremely important for people who owned their own homes and needed to fix stuff. Uh, so this is Modern Carpentry and Joinery Volume 2 Advanced Series, so way over my head. Um, but my great-grandpa has his name right on the top. There is also this fine portrait of the author of the book, Fred T. Hodgson, in a very nice hat, looking very thoughtful, thinking very hard about carpentry. And it was published in Chicago in 1906. Um, it says that there are over 400 practical illustrations. Uh, which are all sort of this type of thing, which means absolutely nothing to me. Uh, I'm sure that if you could read this, it would tell you how to make some really awesome projects. Um, but <laughs> math, look at all these little numbers and points of connections. This is why I am a book historian. And as you've seen, I can't even read a Roman numeral. So God help me if I ever have to build whatever it is they're talking about in here. Um, is that a D&D die? Who knows? Um, unfortunately, my grandfather did not take any notes in here. There's no marginalia. Um, and the fact that it's, you know, in one piece kind of says to me that maybe he didn't use it like in the workshop and maybe used it more for ideas. 
uh, which is something that I will get back to when I talk about the second book. Um, but there are some really nice design inspiration things in here, like this doorway. Um, oh God, more math. Other doors. So it's, it's an inspiration. It's a guidebook. Uh, it's gorgeous on the front. Uh, who can say no to that sort of Art Nouveau swooshiness with that nice uh, early 20th century house in there. And it is splattered with paint. Uh, which maybe it was in the workshop, I am not sure. The second book, this universal design book in this lovely shade of red, um, was also used by my dad uh, when he got his degree in scene design in theater. So um, like the modern carpentry book, there is a lot of sort of inspirational stuff going on in here. Um, many fewer instructional things, but a lot of really great pictures. Um, so this is more of a catalog than it is a guidebook, uh, containing official price lists for windows, doors, and blinds, and a whole list of other stuff. Um, also published in Chicago, uh, in 1905. So it has this excellent, uh, arts and crafts aesthetic happening here. You can see it in this introductory heading here and that A is so good and the index is so good. Um, arts and crafts is a, a particular style that was popular particularly in the UK uh, in this period. Uh, it sort of ran parallel to Art Nouveau so I'm not at all surprised to see it in here. And as we go through once we get out of the index we start into prices. Uh, so check rail windows, I don't know what that is. Um, but then we have pictures, yay pictures! Uh, we have these nice um, sort of paned glasses um, and we also have color plates. So these stained glass plates are stunning. Um, they are kind of sprinkled throughout the book and I mean you can really imagine seeing these in like above the front door of a house built in this period. Um, I feel like I have seen them a lot in older neighborhoods. Um, and then triple front windows for people with larger houses with these really great paned patterns. But this is not just windows. There are plenty of uh, wood articles in here, fancy painted cottage doors. Uh, again, we have this great arts and crafts aesthetic here, oak grained doors. Um, and of course, doors, 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 doors. Uh, so you can see why this would be useful for my dad when he was doing his scene design, uh, especially if you're working on a period play. Lots and lots of nice stairs, obviously many, many stairs, many pages of stairs, and then we kind of get back into windows here. And just look at this Art Nouveau grill. Two dollars per square foot, sign me up. These are just stunning. My favorite part starts kind of towards the end here and we get more color plates. Uh, so we are back sort of in glass and embellished glass, which makes sense. You can get a lot of color out of glass. And so we are talking about all kinds of leaded glass. You can see um, these incredible bits of typography over here, uh, but this is where the party's at. Look at this. Aren't these incredible? I just cannot stop looking at these. Um, sometimes I just kind of sit and look at these patterns. They're so bright, they're like candy. Uh, it's, it's one of those reminders of, you know, you see a picture from 1905 and of course it's in black and white. Um, but in real life, there would have been so much color in this period. Uh, and it's such a wonderful reminder of that. Um, it's just, gee, I cannot get over it. It's so pretty. And this stuff, I mean, I, I'm not an interior designer or anything, but I don't think that this would look out of place in a modern home if you had a certain look you were going for. Uh, I know that I would quite like it in my home. Uh, and then, of course, there are these fun sort of medieval-esque uh, church windows um, you can tell by the, the vaults here, they're going for that medieval look. 
And the rest of the book is things like moldings, uh, other bits of wood craft stuff. Um, but yeah, this is part of the collection that's come down to me from my family, uh, which does not really number in many books. Uh, but the books that I do have that are in the family are really important to me. And it's really neat that um, I, I have books going back this far. Um, you probably do too. Uh, make sure to talk to your grandparents and see if they have anything cool sitting around. Uh, you'd be surprised what might be hiding in a, a sort of drab cover. So finally, by popular demand, let's look at one of my little baby minis. Um, you're probably tired of me showing yucky books, um, and this is no exception. Uh, it has been through the hands of many, uh, and certainly looks it. Um, I will be liberally using my second camera for this, um, because it's, it's very tiny. Uh, I can hold it up here. Uh, hopefully it, uh, it won't focus. Um, but I will cut in some better shots of it. It's in this lovely little leather um, with the ghost of some tooling left over. Um, and it is an almanac. Uh, it is from 1753 and it is an English almanac. It opens with these sweet little marbled pages. Um, not a lot of room for marbling in there, so not a lot of pattern. And then we get into the text. Uh, so it's so tiny. Uh, this is actually engraved. It is not typeset. Um, so you can make teenier letters uh, without having to deal with the nightmare that would be typesetting letters that are smaller than the tip of your fingernail. Um, it has these nice little seals on it. Uh, and the fact that it's engraved means that it is only printed on one side of the page. Um, because the, the way that you print an engraving is, is only one-sided. And that means that there are blanks which children summarily filled in. This book is full of names and doodles and all sorts of things by what I think are a group of friends who owned this book uh, after it went out of date. Uh, and when the parents were finished with this, they probably passed it on to their son or daughter. Uh, and they seem to have a good time passing it amongst themselves. So we have these names sort of interspersed with your regular almanac stuff here. Uh, stuff about the dates, um, different feast days. Uh, and then turn the page and we have more names and a bunch of little faces some of which I think have glasses. Um, so I don't know if this is like a self-portrait, uh, but it is extremely adorable. Uh, then you get more text, more doodles. I love this little Cupid guy. Uh, and then Mary Gregory. So this is interesting because it seems to have been passed around between both little boys and little girls. Uh, so this is a really cool uh, example of ownership. There is one blank opening here. I'm not sure why they skipped this one, uh, but most of the others are just really great. Uh, you can imagine their little hands with their little pens scribbling away, um, making their, their marks. And this one has a whole little poem. Um, I did transcribe it at one point. I, I can't remember exactly what it says. It's, God gave to man an upright face that he might view the stars above his majesty. The heaven is a book. The stars are letters. Father God in the something very tiny is the reader. <laughs> So it's a cute little poem. I don't know if it's from anything. Um, it might be an original piece of poetry written by a child. It probably is from something. Um, but it's such an excellent just snapshot of what was going on in the minds of children at this time. So we have a few more owner names. Another uh, Mary Gregory. Uh, so there are duplicates. Uh, Mary Gregory, her book. 
Daniel Chance his book. Uh, so this might have been successive children as well. A little girl may have passed it on to her cousin, and that cousin may have passed it on to another cousin. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't say, like, we are a bunch of children from Chiswick, England. Uh, so we just have to speculate. Eventually, we get to a uh, table of kings and queens reigns. Uh, and then I think that this is my absolute favorite doodle. Uh, it really looks like the sun emoji to me, or a little lion or something. Um, this is September 1772. Um, and something about talking about a pound of tea? I'm not sure. Uh, it's, it's very, very cute. And finally, the last opening, Thomas Gregory, uh, probably related to Mary Gregory. Uh, and coming to the end with number of Portugal pieces of gold, a bit of a um, conversion table. Um, but this is the cover. Uh, you can see it was once very sort of richly decorated, uh, and it did have a, a little tie or a clip or something that held it shut. Um, but it's missing some leather. It's very well worn on the edges. Uh, it just shows that it was owned by kids. So that wraps up this bookshelf tour. Uh, tune in next week. I will be talking about some of my reference books uh, that I use to make my bite-sized book history videos and for my own research. Um, some of them are very specialized. Some of them are more general. Um, hopefully it won't be as long as this one because I won't be showing and telling quite so much. Um, but thank you for joining me today, and uh, thank you again for your wonderful um, Patreon patronage and donations and for buying these book snakes. Uh, remember that you can find a link to my Etsy in the description below. Um, they're really fun to play with, uh, <laughs> even if you're not holding open rare books. I just think they're fun little things. Um, so I will see you next time and thank you for joining me. Uh, I did have one other request that I say don't bite your books. People seem to miss that even though I kind of considered it to be a bite-sized book history thing with the whole biting motif. But just because you asked, don't bite your books. Mm -hmm.